Greetings, everyone. This is Gwen Allen Karsten. I am the Executive Director for KBAC, Kent Black Action Commission, and we're located in the city of Kent, Washington. Today, we're going to be hosting our candidates in this year's general election from the 33rd District and the 47th District. First of all, we want to congratulate all of those who have moved forward to this position in the general election. It says a lot about them and their campaigns and their ability to become successful. We're hoping that their uh, excitement and their uh, out meeting folks and talking to people about what's going on will continue to represent them whether they are in a seat or not. Our organization is focused on presenting a virtual candidates forum this year. We have done this in the past and we were very successful at it and we hope that we will have the same sort of success and support. We'd like to make sure that everyone gets to hear from our candidates and sometimes everyone cannot c participate in the physical uh, candidates forum, but by doing this virtually, folks are able to sit at home watch the presentation, and enjoy that time of their questions being answered or not, and then they can discuss it before they make their decisions. So with the general election being held on November 8th, we feel that today we can have time to present the candidates as they speak and see what they have to say. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this time together. It's a time of learning, a time of understanding, and a time of knowing what your place is in this election and for the city of Kent. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy this presentation. I know I will. Have a great day. Greetings and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Kent Black Action Commission Virtual Candidate Forum 2022. On behalf of KBAC, we thank you for your participation and for tuning in to this event. Our goal for this forum is to, is to provide you, the voter, access to the candidates vying for your vote to become your elected representative. It's important for people to realize that to influence the legislative process, uh, policies at the federal level, you must begin at the local and state levels. Again, I thank each of you for being here. My name is Charles Karsten. I am the operations manager and senior advisor to the executive director, Gwen Allen Karsten of KBAC. And in the interest of full disclosure, I'm also the husband of Gwen Allen Karsten, executive director, KBAC. Uh, KBAC, since the beginning in 2011, has been providing the local community with information and a voice to share the concerns to our local and state elected officials. Recently, one of those voices, a beloved member of KBAC, Charmaine Boston, lost her battle with brain cancer. Charmaine, as KBAC's community liaison, was present at and supportive of all KBAC-sponsored events. Charmaine supported events sponsored by Glover Empowerment Mentoring. Charmaine also supported community events sponsored by Althea's Louisiana Cajun Store. Charmaine also worked at the Shore West Center in the Food Services Department. We are all saddened by her passing and will continue to work with her spirit and our hearts and in our involvement in the future of the city of Kent and KBAC. And now, allow me to introduce the next uh, candidate as part of this forum, and that is uh, Ms. Tina Orwall. Uh, she re currently represents the 33rd Legislative District and uh, she currently has no opponent in this race, but she has agreed to uh, come to this event and uh, answer our questions. So at this time, I am going to uh, uh, turn it over to Representative Orwall for uh, a opening statement. 
Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm a big fan of KBAC and all the great things you do for our community, so thank you. Uh, Tina Warwell, I've had the honor of representing uh, our community since 2009. Uh, one of the things I've learned along the way is the most important thing I can do is listen and learn from the community. That's where I get my marching orders. Uh, some of the work I've done over the years, I spent five years working with families in Kent on the language access bill, which we finally got passed last session. Again, we want all our families to be welcome, and we want to make sure every parent can be part of their child's education. So I'm really proud of that work. Another thing I'm really working on is 988 to make sure we're going to build a behavioral health crisis system that responds to everyone in the community that's safe and trauma-informed. So again, there's a lot of great work that's being done, and I enjoy doing it in partnership with all the leaders in Kent and throughout the community. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll start with the first series of questions. And if you'd like, I believe we have a copy there. Yes. Um, question number one. Statewide, there are a lot of old and outdated policies in the state of Washington. Do you think there needs to be a complete review and overhaul of policies to reflect the times we're living in, statewide and locally? What would that process look like? Can you elaborate or cite any actions that have been taken uh, to make those changes? Yes, thank you for that question. And I do think we have outdated policies, and that's really important us, for us to review those, to have a community process that involves um, those dialogues. I can think of a couple examples. Um, one of the things found unconstitutional is the death penalty, and we've been trying. I know I've sponsored a bill a number of years to abolish that, and that really should not be in our books anymore. Uh, we know it's racially biased, and again, it's an example of something that should be removed. Another example that I've seen worked on um, is covenants. Um, they were outlawed years ago, but yet when people buy property, they're seeing these really racist, horrible uh, covenants that really should not be on the books anymore. And so I'm really glad that in our state laws and, and leaders in my caucus that those have been removed so that, that people are not subject to seeing that um, you know, it's part of our history and that that is known, but that really shouldn't be on any document they sign or be part of when they're purchasing a home. So I do think we need to go through our laws. We need to look through an equity and social justice lens and make sure that the state is living up to those ideals. Thank you. Question number two. Homelessness and its negative effect on our society and nationwide is real. The three most common causes of homelessness is in our country are mental illness, unemployment, and lack of affordable housing. Many people who are homeless do have jobs, sometimes two or three. The National Coalition for Homeless estimates as many as 40 to 60 percent of people experiencing homelessness in our nation are employed. However, a paycheck does not necessarily solve their homelessness or other challenges. What suggestions do you have to help eradicate homelessness in Washington State in a positive and productive way. What are some potential challenges that would stand in the way of progress? Thank you, and I think this is a huge issue that we all feel touched by. It impacts um, our neighbors and friends, and um, you know, I've met so many of the people that have been living on the street. It's important that we listen and learn from their stories. Um, we know a quarter of the people that are homeless and long-term homeless are veterans who have served our country. And so it's, it's so important that we set up the right services and supports. One of the models that we know is highly effective is called Housing First, where you help people enter housing and then you help provide the services they need. That could be mental health. That could be uh, drug and alcohol, uh, drug use. Um, that could be helping them get a job. And so I think we need to package these things together one of the things I've seen over the years is that there's a lot of resources in Seattle, and we don't have as many resources in South King. So it's really important that we build things in our community that work for our community. One of the opportunities of, that I've been working on is this transit-oriented um, development that's happening around light rail. And those are opportunities to create um, you know, low-income housing, workforce housing, um, job opportunities, and we're really looking at the sites, including one in Kent that's by Highline College, to really make sure we're building a community there, a multicultural community where everyone's welcome and that the housing's affordable. So that's one solution, but again, at the state level, we need to do much more investment in housing and the housing trust fund to make sure 
we're, we're creating housing for all. Thank you. Question number three. Education is primarily, primarily a state and local responsibility in the United States. It is states and communities as well as public and private organizations of all kinds that establish schools and colleges and develop curricula and determine requirements for en enrollment and graduation. The rise of parents' rights groups have gained momentum during the pandemic across the nation, and they demand more say in what children learn in school. Do you support banning books from schools and libraries? Should laws be passed to limit what schools can teach about race, critical race theory in particular, sex and gender? Very important question. And I would tell you, I don't support book bans. Um, I think it's a slippery slope. I think it's um, really important, um, the First Amendment and people's right to free speech. I also worry about what books are taken off shelves and what are we taking away from learning opportunities. You know, I do think families, when kids get home, you know, should talk to their students about what they're learning. I think that's an important process and what they're reading. But we don't want our libraries um, not available for books that a lot of families would want their children reading. So I don't support those. I think information's power. I think our youth need that power. Um, you know, I do a lot on um, sex trafficking, and we know it's really important that kids learn about safe touch. And they have a safe place to report if there's an adult in their life that are harming them. And I think all this information that we give kids is really important because we know the number one place where that will get reported is the schools, right? That's our safe zone. And when school's not there, or even during the pandemic, the reporting went down. And it wasn't that that wasn't uh, occurring, that kids weren't being harmed, but they weren't, um, they didn't have a place to report necessarily if that harm was happening in the house. So I think information's power. Uh, I think parents do worry about kids. I'm worried about youth. They've been greatly impacted. But I hope as a community we can come together and say, how do we support our youth? Uh, we know there's record number of behavioral health issues going on. We need more support in our schools. Um, the, the suicide rates are increasing for youth and youth of color. And so I hope as a community we can come together and say, how do we support our youth during this time and it's safe and be working together? Thank you. And now, I believe it's time for your closing statement. Well, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, it's so important to have a dialogue with the community, and so thank you. I know these are difficult times to set these things up, so I really appreciate that. And again, you know, I'm really proud. I, I know I'm here with my colleague who's amazing, and I'm really proud of the work we're doing. All the work is really through an equity and social justice lens. And again, we want to make sure whether it's our K-12 system that they're teaching accurate information um, that's true to our history, right? And that we're addressing um, what's going on in our community. There's a lot of trauma right now and secondary trauma. We know a lot of behavioral health issues, but I think we can come together as a community and we can, we can find hope and we can build a healthier community together. So thank you. All right, and thank you. As we are holding our virtual candidates forum, we have to take a moment and express our sorrow and our love for one of our members, Ms. Charmaine Boston. If she were with us, she would be right here, enjoying this time and serving others. So with that in mind, we're going to make sure that her presence is felt by offering snacks and things that will help with a person's energy level. She was always concerned about the well-being of other folks, and I know that she would want us to carry on as if she were here. We will miss her. We will miss her smile. We will miss her love for one another. We will miss her taking charge and doing what she did so well. So with that in mind, we say rest in peace, Charmaine, and we'll see you soon.
Ladies and gentlemen, now we have with us Ms. Mia Gregerson, who is the current representative for the 33rd District, position number two. She is also running uh, unopposed. And uh, Ms. Gregerson will start with a opening statement. Thank you, Charles. And first of all, I want to say uh, my condolences to the loss of Charmaine recently. I know having a, someone um, who's active and a leader is such a loss for our community. I just want to pay recognition to that. And I Thank think you. our community is really facing a lot of loss and grief right now. And um, being a, a leader here in this community is partly um, my responsibility to stay connected to the community. And that's my promise, regardless of my, um, you know, the outcome of this race. Yes. Okay. Now we're going to start with uh, a series of three questions. And... The first one is, statewide, there are a lot of old and un outdated policies in the state of Washington. Do you think there needs to be a complete review and overhaul of policies to reflect the times we're living in, statewide and locally? What would that process look like? Uh, can you elaborate or cite any actions that have been taken to make changes? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's really important, especially right now. Um, you know, the pandemic has really given us and forced us to have an opportunity to really look at our processes and our policies and who's being left out. We knew that the recovery would be uneven. We knew that we were facing a potential um, recession. And as one of the budget leads, uh, we went right to work to make sure that that was not going to happen. And, and while doing that, right, we learned that anti-hunger efforts, that um, uh, did the digital divide, those things were real for our families and our communities right away. But luckily, we've been doing a lot of work um, in our local community here. I think Kent is such a great example of where we really sh um, showed the rest of the state and actually the rest of the nation where when you trust, you have a strong network of trusted messengers in the community and you invest in them and you, you provide resources to them early, um, that we can have a real great response to things regardless of the problem. Um, the census outreach was another effort that we were able to just repeat over again when the pandemic hit. And as one of the budget um, vice chairs, I'm very excited to continue to go through each line item in the budget and ask those more difficult questions. Who's being left out? Are we paying down only a certain number in our caseloads? Why are we not paying down the entire caseload? Who is being left out? If you have a citizenship status, why are you being left out? What can we do in response to that. And I think, um, you know, you've seen some great pilot projects come from the federal dollars, and we're hopeful that some of those things can become permanent. One is Senator Saldana's work. Um, I'm very proud to work in partnership with her around the un um, unemployment um, stipends for those that are undocumented. They participate in our economy, and they should also be able to um, have resources to keep the, uh, stay in our community and be able to thrive. Thank you. Okay, question number two. Homelessness and its negative effect on our society nationwide is real. The three most common causes of homelessness in our country are mental illness, unemployment, and lack of affordable housing. Many people who are homeless do have jobs, sometimes two or three. The National Coalition for Homeless estimates as many as 40 to 60% of people experiencing homelessness in our nation are employed. However, a paycheck does not necessarily solve their homelessness or other challenges. What suggestions do you have to help eradicate homelessness in Washington State in a positive and productive way? And what are some of the potential challenges that would stand in the way of progress? That's a really big question, and I'm definitely committed to being there to make sure that we see through all of those different elements that it's going to reduce and re remove um, our lack of affordable housing, whether it's through policies related to zoning. Um, you heard my seatmate earlier talk about um, racist covenants, um, reducing the barriers when it comes to uh, gaining access to financial opportunity, and of course, um, working very hard to raise the wages. We need everyone to be able to have a living wage with benefits. And until then, we need to work extra hard, for, especially for our women, women of color, who we know uh, by statistics make less for the same work. Um, and I think that, again, going back to the budget, we were very fortunate to be able to use over a billion dollars towards 
uh, rental assistance, helping with um, legal support. And we've learned a lot with the moratoriums more locally being, um, re, you know, stopped. And um, that's one of those areas where we need to continue to roll up our sleeves, bring the most adverse people to the table so that it doesn't become a partisan issue, it mm-hmm. becomes a people issue. It's not businesses against um, schools or we know one in 30, excuse me, one in five by 2030 are going to be over the age of 65. That's a whole different community with very limited income and they may be property rich. So we need to be able to help make sure that they can age in place, but also our families should be able to thrive where they choose. Yes. All right. Thank you. Question number three. Education is primarily a state and local responsibility in the United States. It is states and communities, as well as public and private organizations of all kinds that establish schools and colleges and develop curricula and determine requirements for enrollment and graduation. The rise of parents' rights groups have gained momentum during the pandemic across the nation, and they demand more say in what children learn in school. Do you support banning books from schools and libraries? Should laws be passed to limit what schools can teach about uh, race, critical race theory in particular, uh, sex and gender is another uh, thought on that? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't support banning um, books from schools and libraries. I think that we have, um, we're at a moment in time where our families and our children are fighting to get correct and factual information, age-appropriate information. And this should not be a partisan, rhetoric-filled fight. Um, We need to make sure that our educators are able to provide the resources to our children to gain access to to education. I think forums like this are so important, too, because um, in South King County, we are in a media desert where we don't have four or five print media um, you know, stories about us in a positive way also. And I think storytelling um, is so important. So I absolutely am against banning books and libraries. I also am against um, limiting, again, going um, what our teachers and our educators can talk about when it comes to sex, critical race theory, um, and gender. We in the state worked very hard to pass a comprehensive sex education package, and we're going to stand true to that. Um, and again, a lot of times policies are important, but if they're not funded, that's where we're not able to get the resources to the community to be able to take advantage of, of the policies. And so uh, I just, again, want to remind folks that not one Republican voted for the budget. So I stand very true to um, funding our values and the policies that are important to us. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. And now that takes us back to a closing statement. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today and allowing me my voice. Um, There's just so much weight on our shoulders, aren't there, to make sure that our community is feeling safer and able to thrive. And um, I really am committed to working together in partnership. That means um, connecting and learning and listening, not when it's just campaign season. Um, I've been so fortunate to be able to serve in this um, position now for almost 10 years and before that a city council member. Um, but there's no problem that's too big when, when we're all willing to come together to the table, and that's going to continue to be my commitment. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.